you can either choose to take a part of this or you can choose not to take a part of this either way you're gonna have to and if you don't act now you're gonna regret it in a couple of years because you're not gonna have any people working for you or any guests coming hello and welcome to a special episode of the recipe i'm your host james clasper as regular listeners will know this is a podcast about the new generation of restaurants and the people behind them a show in which we explore topics related to opening and running a restaurant like the importance of having a strong concept of finding the right location or choosing the right name but here's the thing about the restaurant world it has a dark side too and it's one that we don't think we should shy away from on the recipe because if the new generation of restaurants sincerely wants to do things better than their predecessors, then surely that involves having frank conversations about some ugly home truths and then working to make a change. So in this episode of The Recipe, we're gonna be talking about gender equality and sexual misconduct in the restaurant industry. Recent years have seen a depressing litany of cases, from the impending trial of Mario Batali to the eye-opening accounts on sites like Hospitality Bullshit to the fresh wave of allegations about the Danish restaurant scene. But while it's important to shine a light into the murkiest corners of the industry, it can sometimes feel like little is actually being done to change it. Which is what makes the work of Sofia Bodovich Olsen so interesting. A decorated chef based in Gothenburg, Sofia reached boiling point last year following misconduct allegations by a dozen women against one of Sweden's most famous male chefs. Angered by the culture of silence that had enabled his impunity, Sofia launched a campaign to deliver structural change to the Swedish restaurant industry. To learn more about the campaign and what inspired it, I phoned Sofia in early February and began by asking her to introduce herself. My name is Sofia Bordovic Olsson. I'm the operating manager of uh, restaurant Vrå in Gothenburg, Sweden. So we are situated in a big hotel right in the middle of Gothenburg called Clarion Hotel Post. And uh, we are owned by the hotel, but I run the restaurant. We started in 2012 as a very small restaurant with only like 30 seats and a very small budget. <laughs> so, and now 10 years later, we are in a in other lo location of the hotel and a much bigger restaurant with uh, 90 seats. And uh, we are working with the local produce of West Coast of uh, Sweden. Uh, the, and we are influenced by Japanese techniques and uh, flavors. It sounds amazing. I must come and visit uh, my, my seamless opportunity. Um, Tell me, I mean, how did you become a chef? Why did you become a chef? Basically, it was always a passion, uh, first of all. So as many other chefs, uh, my grandmother and my mother and my whole family has done a great job in, <laughs> you know, teaching me and spreading the passion and love about cooking and also to, to meet around cooking and the stove and the kitchen and all, all of that. But I think I was around... 14 when I started working extra in uh, cafes and restaurants so it was always there and I was cooking a lot at home as well and um, when I was around 23 I was working as a chef cooking vegetarian food in a cool place here in Gothenburg with a lot of music and uh, young people and a really fun place and at that point, I was yeah, 22, 23, I realized that this is what I should do. You know, when I started working in the kitchen, it was like a revelation. You know, for the first time in my life, I realized that, you know, I can walk and talk and use my hands and my brain at the same time. And I'm finally chasing the, the clock <laughs> instead of the other way around. This is finally something that I could do. I feel alive. From the, you know, the moment you were in the industry, did you experience the darker side of the industry? Yeah, I would say so, definitely. Especially after I decided to really make a career, or it was more that I really wanted to be a good chef. 
So I realized I need to get the proper education and start from the beginning. So when I was 24 and had my first daughter, I decided to be serious and really try to develop within the industry. And then I came to to the first Michelin star restaurant I ever um, visited uh, on a practice. And uh, I would say it started right there and then that I realized that it's not only about the passion for the job and the passion to deliver the best experience for the guests, but there's also something else that I need to understand and I need to, yeah, kind of handle to be able to continue in the industry. So there was a lot of uh, sexual harassment and uh, just a feeling that I was not just a chef, but uh, first of all, I was a woman. And I uh, had to have a strategy to kind of uh, cope with being different than the group. And to I just wanted to respect as a chef and as a professional. But I, um, my experience was that it was really difficult to be seen as uh, one in the group. I was, first of all, a woman and someone you could objectify. and so on so that was something i needed to handle at the same time as i needed to handle how do i learn as much as possible as a young chef and how do i develop as fast as i can in this environment and did you feel that you were able to speak up about what you were experiencing and seeing happen yes um i have a lot of support from uh, my family uh, both my husband and uh, also my mother. I, I grew up with my mother. She's a very strong woman and she's always been in leading positions and she's never been afraid to to say or speak out about their rights. So I feel that I have very good uh, support from at home and that was really important for me to always draw the line, so to say. So if I um, experienced that someone was... Uh, walking through, uh, past my line, I was always telling them. Even if it's, it's really hard, you know, when you are the youngest and the the least, uh, you have the least pondus and the least power, and you are really dependent on the person in charge of of the new place where you are. So it's always difficult when you're in that position to speak out because you are uh, risking so much. You know, they can just put you out in a second but what I realized during the years is that I really I, I really draw the line where I felt that this is not acceptable at all and I've said that this is not acceptable for me but there are so many things you know in the gray zone <laughs> so to say you know there are black and white but there is a very 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 big gray zone and that's maybe the hardest part because as the more and the worse the harassments are, the, the more difficult it is to identify what's happening in this gray zone. That's okay or something I can live with, but at the same time, it's really affecting me in a bad way. And I'm also getting used to this behavior, normalizing it, uh, because it's not as bad as, as the things that are really over the line, so to say. So this is something I realized uh, now, many years later. And, and of course, what, what you're talking about as well is, is your own individual response to a problem. But really what, what we're talking about here is a, a systemic problem. So tell me how you kind of became the, you know, a chef activist. Tell me the story of how your, your thinking evolved and, and the role that, that the restaurant industry in Sweden's response to Me Too it was a spark of sorts and how that kind of inspired what, what you ended up doing last year. Yeah, basically I've always been a person who uh, have a strong uh, motivation to speak out and try to make things better. So that's something I have in me. Uh, and I was, I was a vegetarian and a vegan when I was young for many, many years. And I tried to, I was a part of an association called Food Not Bombs, 
when I was like 14, 15, 16, you know, we collected free food from a lot of different stores and we cooked the food and gave it to homeless people like every Saturday in Gothenburg. It was like a really, you know, concrete way to show that the system is fucked up, so to say. You know, we have free food and we have people starving. And if we connect it, we can solve problems. So I always had that kind of motivation to try to contribute to a positive development. And then when I started up in the in the industry myself, I, I kind of collected experiences from different restaurants, having uh, a feeling that could have been done in another way. You know, if I one day get the possibility to set the frames, I will try to do it in another way. And 10 years ago, when we opened here, we were two female chefs. It was me and my former boss, Frida Ronge. And that kind of put me in a new framework because there were no, you know, macho men who took over. And it was a very cool experience because it was either me or her, you know, there were no one else to, to, to depend on. And there were no one else who took uh, the, the, the leading part, so to say. So she was like, okay, this is meat. I'm not good at meat. You have to fix the meat. <laughs> the meat part is yours. And I was like, okay, uh, you know, you, you take the hot stove. I take the cold section and so on and so i had the possibility to develop my own uh, skills in a very safe environment and i realized quite quick that this was the first time i worked in a kitchen without any uh, male chefs and my uh, way of uh, making jokes my way of talking suddenly changed you know so i realized aha the humor, the talk, the the jargon we say in Swedish, you know, the way of speaking, it wasn't my way of speaking. I was just adjusting to the ruling uh, way of doing things. So there was a really uh, kind of important knowledge for me to make. And from there, I just started to develop more and more and more. A couple of years ago, I took over and uh, Frida moved to Stockholm to open another restaurant. And I was thinking a lot about the culture in the restaurant. So how can we make the culture in the in the group be better? And how can we work with how, how we take care of the knowledge of the team and how we include each other and so on? When I realized it was working and it was giving results and a lot of young female chefs were applying to my kitchen to work. I realized it was possible to do it in that way. And it was much easier for more people to to adjust to that. And then we had Me Too. It was a amazing strength in the collective way of saying, I'm not going to carry this, this shame and this guilt and this shit anymore because it's not my shit to carry you know we're going to put the blame where it belongs with the molester not with me and with so many uh, women doing that all over the world was a great uh, free <laughs> feeling of freedom at the same time i had to you know as everyone else re uh, kind of experience everything i i had buried deep down and in Sweden, we had a lot of different appeals from different sectors. And one of, of them was from Swedish uh, female actresses. Uh, really famous actresses uh, came together and spoke out. We also had one in, in the restaurant industry, but it didn't really lift, so to say. My experience is that nothing really happened. We said together that this happens here as well, but then it was case closed. But the actresses got a lot of attention because they were really famous. And a lot of people like myself were thinking, oh, if that famous actress has the, you know, the guts to say stuff like this and, and t- tell about what they have experienced, maybe I can do it as well. So 
I saw something really important in that and I had already then a thought about we should have done the same in the restaurant industry because we have a lot of famous chefs uh, and people are looking at us. But nothing happened at that point. A couple of years later, uh, there was a big scandal in Sweden, in the Swedish restaurant industry. One of our most famous chefs who are also cooking for the king and so on, 12 females who had been working for him were witnessing about really serious kind of harassments in different ways, both sexual and others. And also the consequences, threats, economic deals to make them be quiet and so on. And I was really upset. You know, I was really angry about it because it was very obvious that this had been happening for a very long time. It was a part of the culture. A lot of people have been knowing about it and no one had said anything. And I also got the feeling that this could have been a scandal for a couple of days and then the same thing is going to happen. You put the lid on again and nothing happens. So that was my biggest motivation to try to do something about it for real. So first of all, uh, I thought we need to go together to uh, a lot of um, females in leading positions with known faces, so to say. We need to go together. We need to show Sweden that this is not only an individual, it's not an individual molester. This is a structural problem that needs to be solved in a structural way. And I thought we also need to support the the victims that had uh, the guts to witness about this. Because it's so easy that, oh, yeah, it's just hard, it's just that one, and it's just him, he's an asshole, whatever. But, you know, and then you don't do anything about it. So I thought if we share our stories as well, uh, famous faces, and we share the same stories from our experiences in, in working in the restaurant uh, business. And we say, we are, we are here, uh, we have the same stories, and we haven't achieved our positions because of it but even though we have this experience we have come to the positions we have and we are ready to put the blame where it belongs and we are something that was really important for us was also to to make a mark that we are also leading a positive development of the industry it's not just that we are saying that we we are victims or we had a really shitty in the past, but we are also here to take place and show our faces and be role models for the next generations coming into the industry and everyone who are sharing our thoughts about it. You know, we we love our industry and we are pushing the development for an equal, sustainable industry for everyone who loves this. What were the kind of the the events or the campaigns that you kind of put into action? I collected 65 big role models, uh, female role models of the Swedish restaurant business. And we had a very big article in one of the biggest newspapers where we had share our stories with name and a picture. So I was actually standing behind my own story, which was really, really hard in the beginning but also very important to make it reliable and honest in a way. And at the same time, we were sharing like nine points of demands, what we want to achieve. Also a lot of text about how we can see improvements in the industry and so on. Became like a really, a really big impact and we got a lot of attention and support. What was the name of the, the campaign? It has a hashtag. It's Swedish. Yeah, I won't yeah. <laughs> it's called Här tar det slut. Basically means hashtag it ends now. So it was just to, to make it more obvious what we were talking about. Time's up. Yes, yeah. time's up.
first uh, we wrote was, we do not accept the culture of silence that protects men in positions of power. Now we put the guilt and shame where it belongs with the perpetrators and those who watched silently. Because the silent culture was really a big problem. We want to see zero tolerance for sexism, racism and in all restaurants. We want to see an equal investment in industry competitions. We want the industry to value and invest in leadership all the way from the training period to the highest level. Uh, we demand a modern organization in the leading layers of restaurants where we build the entire organization to create a safe and equal workplace. And we realize that this requires active work and um, collaboration with a lot of leading organizations like the uh, in Sweden, it's uh, the union and the CITA, who is the in- employer's organization and so on. We want to see more women leaders, owners and investors in the restaurant industry. And we want to recreate and maintain confidence in our industry to, in the younger generations. So after the appeal, I think we were all really drained, to be honest. And now, uh, almost one, one and a half year later, I was starting to form a plan of how the next step could see. And that's where we we are now. You've just had a, I don't know how you define it, a conference, a seminar, a gathering? Yeah, so it's actually um, several parts of it. It started out with a seminar um, part, but I just kept on adding things. <laughs> so first day we just met in, in an informal way here at the Claren Hotel Post. So that was the first part. We just ate me- a dinner and chatted and had some wine and, you know, um, talked about everything. And then on Monday we started with the seminar. As you said, I invited several experts like a, uh, equality expert and uh, another expert in developing organizations. And we had a lot of, of heavy people from the city, like representing the city. And then after lunch, we, uh, we continued with a workshop. So, and then we, we started working really, really, you know, in detail to, to get a clear way, a clear path to continue with. What what are some of the concrete steps that that you're now taking, or what are what are some of the the, the resolutions that have been made, and and what happens next? Yeah. So before this, we were sixty five females who had done something to, together, but we didn't have any framework or organization. So we decided to form a new association. That was one of the most important decisions. So I'm now the head of that organization, and we are going to have our first meeting in two weeks, setting the rest of the board and uh, the kind of structure for the association. When that's ready, we're going to move on with the communication. I think it will be like one homepage and maybe a Facebook group. So everyone who wants to be a part of this development can join us. That's one of the most important things. And besides that, we agreed on three focus areas that we think is most prioritized to achieve a a quick development. Leadership, culture, and also education. It It all comes together in a way. We think that's really, really important to kind of create the value through leadership because what we are valuing now in leadership is like hard, uh, you know, uh, tough leaders with uh, strong muscles and a strong head kind of leaders. But we want to value a humble leader or a listening leader and a mature leader who can make everyone in the team feel included and valuable and help them to develop. So that's uh, something we're going to start with. Leadership, education and culture. These are our three focus areas. I mean, there are so much, you know, research and so much development in the leadership area in the world. Why shouldn't we use that in the restaurant industry? You know, we still have very young 
immature leaders who are recruited in a homosocial way. So we have a quite equal industry, so to say, in how many females and how many men are working. But we have a lot of more uh, men in the power positions, so to say. And they tend to recruit other men who are, you know, playing the same sports or using the same language or having the same kind of, of culture. So that's what we need to break up and start recruiting new leaders and uh, educate those leaders so that they can become good leaders. Have you had any pushback, any resistance, any voices on the side sort of saying, there isn't really a problem, don't be silly? No, I don't think so. It's more that a lot of people are, are quiet, you know? Uh, especially men, so they don't say anything to me at all. But my position right now is that you can either choose to take a part of this or you can choose not to take a part of this. Either way, you're going to have to. And if you don't act now, you're going to regret it in a couple of years because you can't, you're not going to have any people working for you or any guests coming. I mean, that's what's happening right now. You know, if we see the cancel culture and everything that's happening in the younger generations, for them, it's like a hygiene factor that there shouldn't be homophobia or sexual harassment and stuff like that. So how are we going to make our industry grow? And how are we going to get the new guests coming to us? Because the older ones are, you know, the older chefs and the older guests are going to go away (laughs) one day or another and then the new generations are coming and I think it's really necessary to to think about it. In a way you've perhaps answered my what was going to be my last question which is what what gives you reason to be hopeful what gives you reason to be optimistic is it simply that there is a younger generation now that just will not stand for for what has previously been you know, excused or ignored or otherwise in the, in the past. Exactly. And we need to, to show them role models. We need to show them a way, a future in the industry. And we need to, you know, just work together to make everything better. That's basically, it. for me, it's not controversial. I mean, it's a basic human rights that everyone who loves this industry, who loves to work with service, loves to give something to the guests should have that right to do that work without being, you know, uh, harassed. It's, it's a basic human right. And I can't understand how it can be controversial in any way. You know, everyone should just be allowed to, to work with what they love and, and do that as good as they can. So I have all the hope in the world. And, and I really have the feeling right now that we are doing something that's going to change for real. It's not just talk. We are walking the walk and talking the talk. And it's an important work that needs to be done. That was Sofia Bodovic Olsen, chef and operations manager at restaurant Vro in Gothenburg and the initiator of the Hort Order Slut campaign. And I think she's absolutely right. This topic shouldn't be controversial. What she and other women want is to be seen as full human beings rather than as sexual objects, for their safety and movement through the world to be accepted in the way that men's is. And of course, Sophia's right to keep the conversation going. Women are being harassed, abused, and assaulted in restaurants every single day. And we should never stop raising awareness of that. She's right too to refuse to accept the culture of silence that protects men in power. What makes it especially galling, of course, is that it's happening in restaurants that go on about being sustainable and ethical and that won't shut up about their respect for nature, their reverence for ingredients. The hypocrisy is bad enough, but what this shows is just how normalized certain standards of behavior are and how acceptable the culture of sexism seems to be, which is exactly why women like Sophia are so focused on trying to shift cultural norms. And yet, the onus shouldn't just be on women. Men have work to do too. Work that's going to require more than making statements or reposting support for a hashtag. At the end of the day, you see, 
This is about understanding who has power and how it's used. Right now, of course, most power lies in the hands of the men who own restaurants and run their kitchens. So for cultural norms to change, those men are going to have to give up some of their power. In part, that means promoting more women into leadership roles and making restaurants more democratic and more accountable. And remember what Sophia said about the atmosphere in the kitchen when she and another woman ran it? How liberating the culture was? And how many young female chefs subsequently applied to work with her? Well, in short, investors need to back more women-owned restaurants and women-run kitchens. But in any case, as Sophia says, time's up. For one thing, hundreds of thousands of people have left the hospitality industry in the past couple of years, many never to return. And the scarcity of staff means it's an employee's market now. The power is already starting to shift. And as Sophia explains so clearly, cultural norms outside the restaurant industry are changing too. The younger generation of chefs, waiters, and diners no longer tolerate racism, sexism, and discrimination of any kind. So if restaurants don't start doing the hard work and changing, but instead put their fingers in their ears and pretend that nothing's happening, well, then they risk being left behind and having neither staff nor customers. And there's nothing sustainable about that. This episode was written, produced, and hosted by me, James Clasper, for Superb. And I sincerely hope you've enjoyed listening to it. If so, feel free to share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. We'll be back with another episode of The Recipe in a couple of weeks. Until then, take care, and thanks again for listening. <laughs>